Good morning or good afternoon to all of you folks. I see there's two of me here. Um, really one more than absolutely ever needs to be happen. So in today's format, what we're going to do is introduce a number of questions and I'm going to throw them out to the panel and I'd like the panel to take their stab at answering them and feel free to comment on other answers that you may have heard. So let's start with the first one and here it goes. Comment about what the Russians might do in Ukraine has entertained the possibility that Russia may try to coerce Ukraine with cyber attacks rather than in an open invasion. Should NATO be trying to push against that tendency in the belief that cyber attacks would be more harmful or the reverse, which may mean paradoxically hand-wringing about cyber attacks, in the belief that an invasion may be more harmful. And yes, we understand that doing both of them is also a Russian option. So basic question is, is there worthwhile trying to deter one in many ways at the expense of the other in the hopes that what they do is less harmful rather than more harmful? And with that, I'm gonna throw the floor open. Um, and if no other, we don't do this any other way. Let's do this in alphabetical order, please. Шановні колеги, дозвольте мені виступити з перекладачем. Dear colleagues, may uh, may I have the floor with the translator. Так мені буде більш розумно вам пояснити, що відбувається в Україні. It will be easier and more comprehensively for me to explain what's happening in Ukraine. Вже протягом вісьми років ми спостерігаємо дії Російської Федерації, яка супроводжується двома факторами. Well, for, over, for almost eight years we've been watching Russia's actions with, uh, which are uh, com com complemented by two, uh, two directions. Це інформаційна, дезінформаційна агресія, яка поєднана з кібератаками. That's information and disinformation aggression which is combined with cyber attacks. І зазвичай після цього або одночасно з цим відбувається ескалація конфлікту. And afterwards or almost simultaneously we have an escalation of conflict in the east. Але також такі події супроводжуються більш деструктивними діями під час державних свят, які відбуваються на території нашої держави. But such actions, uh, actions are also combined with some uh, host, uh, minor uh, hostile actions during some state holidays. Ці позиції можна розділити на три етапи. And those uh, points can be divided into three steps. Це етап 14-го 16-го року. Uh, this is the period of from 2014 to 2016. Другий етап це 16-й рік, 19-й. The second stage is the 2016 till 2019. 19-й і по теперішній час. And since the 2019 till today. Якщо беремо перший етап, то в першому етапі Російська Федерація використовувала свої ресурси відкрито. If we speak about the first stage, the Russia was using its resources uh, uh, openly. Хаотично і по мірі можливості. And it was also uh, chaotically and uh, to the extent that the resources allowed. Що це означає? Це означає, що uh, спецпідрозділи і хакери, які працюють фактично на спецслужбі Російської Федерації, постійно Моніторили мережу і інфраструктуру України. Uh, which means that uh, hackers and uh, special service officers who work for R Russian uh, Federation, they constantly monitor the information space and cyberspace. Під час виявлення будь-якої вразливості, вони відразу ж атакували, спробували свої можливості і вчиняли деструктивні дії. When they arrived at some vulnerability, they simultaneously conducted the attacks and tested their capabilities. І вже після того, як вони отримують інформацію або яку вони шкоду можуть нанести, вона супроводжувалася інформаційно. And after they discover the malicious influence they can exert, they do some more hostile actions. При цьому information space. При цьому інформаційний контент був будь-який. Головне сказати і розповсюдити 
як на території Російської Федерації, України та поза її межами, в тому числі Європейському Союзі. And this information content could be of any kind. The major point was to to make it, to spread it in Ukraine and in the world worldwide as well. Другий етап уже відрізнявся тим, що інформаційний контент готувався більш кваліфікованими спеціалістами, і він повністю інтегрувався під ті події, які насправді відбувалися в державі. The second stage is characterized by that those actions were tailored to particular developments and events which were happening in the state. І кібератаки відбувалися вже більш цілеспрямовано на безпосередніх державних службовців, осіб, які представляють інтерес у військовій сфері, And we had more targeted cyber attacks at uh, civil servants, people who represent the military sphere and other. І відбувався агресивний потенціал на підприємства, які найбільш надавали послуги в державному секторі щодо тих чи інших інформаційних ресурсів. And they uh, were exploiting the aggressive, uh, aggressive potential against uh, the state enterprises and other enterprises which provided uh, uh, services to government structures. Дані атаки повністю супроводжувалися ідентичним одночасним етапом екскалації конфлікту. Це були перемовини в Парижі, були нормандський формат, в Мінській. Вони повністю супроводжувалися як за декілька днів, так і під час самих цих зустрічей. And those attacks were uh, combined with uh, particular stages of uh, uh, developments in the front line and the negotiations process, whether it be the, the, norm, the Minsk negotiations or Normandy, and they were uh, simultaneous with those events. Але і в цей другий період ми почали фіксувати можливості, не можливості, а наявні факти Вербування наших працівників в ІТ-сфері, в сфері, які обслуговують мережеву державну інфраструктуру і забезпечують державні реєстри. And this on this second stage we also noticed the fact that our specialists in the critical infrastructure uh, facilities and uh, enterprises they were uh, hunted for by the Russian secret services. І саме в цей період, якщо ви пам'ятаєте, відбулася Славно, звісно, в душках атака під назвою «Нотпетя». And in this period we had the notorious cyber attack «Нотпетя». Саме тут, в цей період і в цій атаці ми саме підозрюємо, і в нас є повністю вважати, що в компанії, яка надавала найбільш потужну на той час ресурсну підтримку Балтерії, через яку було здійснено атаку, був влаштований на роботу агент ФСБ Російської Федерації. And uh, at this point we are uh, we are sure that uh, during this attack the Russian agent was uh, employed in the company providing major accounting services for governmental structures. І цим я хотів підкреслити, що саме в другому етапі спецслужби Російської Федерації діяли на території як ФСБ Російської Федерації, головне управління розвідки, так і служба зовнішньої розвідки. And all major Russian secret services such as FSB, the Foreign Intelligence Service and other services were engaged in this process. Така велика кількість активності Російської Федерації на території України нам дозволяла дуже швидко їх виявляти, встановлювати їх бекдори. Тому на початку 19-го року в Російській Федерації прийняли рішення про те, що обмежити певну кількість тих спецслужб, які будуть вчиняти деструктивні дії на нашій території. And such robust activities of all those secret services gave us opportunity to reveal all those actions and so far in 2019 Russia decided to limit the number of secret services engaged in such actions. І такі привілеї залишилися за фактично військовими розвідками, так як головне управління розвідки Російської Федерації, так і служби зовнішньої розвідки. And only the military intelligence and the foreign intelligence services of Russian Federation were authorized to engage in those activities. Між якими ми так зрозуміли вже по ідентифікації їх діяльності, були чітко розподілені ролі. 
And as we have identified, those structures had uh, separate uh, roles in this process. І їх об'єкти впливу. And the objects of their influence. Якщо головне управління розвідки повністю було зосереджене на правоохоронних військових об'єктах, if the main intelligence directorate of the Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation was focused on military objects and the servicemen, і частково відомств уряду, які забезпечували державну безпеку, and partially on uh, intelligence services and also the governmental structures which ensure the state security. То служба зовнішньої розвідки Російської Федерації повністю була націлена на всі інші об'єкти критичної інфраструктури. And uh, the Foreign Intelligence Service of Russian Federation was tar- targeted at uh, other uh, objects of critical infrastructure. Судові та інші урядові об'єкти. Uh, governmental objects and the judiciary objects. І переважала фактично бойова складова головного управління розвідки, тому що фактично у 2021 році в переважній більшості ми саме фіксували їх активність на зазначених об'єктах. And the combat military component prevailed because in 2021 we detected the major actions by the military intelligence service officers. Саме третій період у нас відзначається тим, що такі атаки почали відбуватися на родичів, знайомих, дітей, тих службовців, які їх цікавили. And uh, this third stage is characterized by that uh, those cyber attacks were carried out against the families and the relatives of those people engaged in the uh, military, uh, our military service. І це вже відбувалося, не зважаючи на ескалацію конфлікту чи будь-які інші переговори, які тривали Україною через посередників з Російської Федерації. This happened regardless of any uh, hostile actions and negotiations process uh, with the Russian proxies. І це супроводжується до цього часу. And... Вони розробляють висококласний професійний фішинг. And this is uh, continuing till now, they are developing high-class phishing. Для отримання доступу до усіх облікових записів ці об'єктів, які їх цікавлять. Uh, to gain access to the, all objects they are interested in. І під час екскалації вони використовують ці вразливості і починають деструктивні дії. And during escalation they use the, these vulnerabilities and uh, launch their aggressive actions. За, саме за цей період ми почали фіксувати масовані, потужні атаки, це, це ціле спрямовані саме на Міністерство оборони, Міністерство закордонних справ, на судову систему, на Кабінет Міністрів України. And at this uh, stage we discovered the, the large-scale massive attacks against the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense on critical infrastructure and other institutions. І є такий незвичний етап, коли ми почали в кінці 2020 року, на початку 2021 року фіксувати діяльність саме хакерських груп, афілійованих до Білоруської Республіки. And the uh, very unusual and unique uh, stage was at the end of 2020, the beginning of the pre- last year, was the activities of hacker groupings tied to Belarus intelligence services. І, напевно, саме цей період і саме ваші фахівці теж спостерігали велику активність спецслужб Російської Федерації та Росії Білоруської Республіки, активності на території Європейської Союзу, в тому числі Республіки Польщі. And I guess your experts also noticed the activities of uh, Be- Be- Belarus uh, hackers not, uh, not only uh, happening in our country, but also in European countries and particularly in Poland. Наша розвідка дуже часто і постійно виявляє факти координації основних офіцерів, які координують діяльність чотирьох основних хакерських угрупувань, які супроводжують головне управління розвідки. 
and our uh, our experts, cybersecurity uh, experts, they uh, trace the um, uh, features of four major hacker groupings, which are tied to the main intelligence directorate. Two of the main are всем видоме ATP Uh, two major uh, of them are the well-known ATP-28. Sandwar. Uh, Sandwar. ATP-29. And, and ATP-28. Це основні масиви, які фактично вже після себе розгалужують на дуже багато дрібних підгруп, які за своєю кваліфікацією і напрямком здійснюють діяльність. Those are the, the major, uh, major structures, which are uh afterwards uh, separated and they has the network of activities uh, and, and uh, actors who conduct uh, malicious activities і ми почали аналізувати співпадіння кіберактивності в просторі інформаційної активності і військової агресії на сході нашої держави and we began to trace the coincidence between uh, uh, hostile information actions cyber attacks and uh, 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 boosting up of the hostilities in the front line. And this dynamics is uh, is there for sure. Тому фактично влітку 21-го року президентом України було прийнято термінове рішення про розбудову негайної системи кібер кібервійськ, які б могли здійснювати контратаку і фактично здійснювати аналогічні підготовчі конструктивні дії на території Російської Федерації. And therefore, uh, in summer 2021, uh, our president made an urgent decision to begin developing and establishing the cyber troops to uh, do uh, counter actions, uh, counter measures and uh, some, not only defensive measures on our territory but also on the territory of Russian Federation. І залиця дуже невизначена у світі конфігурації термінології. And uh, but the major point is that in the world there is still no no uh, common uh, terminology. Чи можливо вважати наявні кібернетичні і інформаційні атаки військової агресії? Uh, whether we can consider the existing uh, cyber attacks and hostile uh, uh, act of aggression. Чи ми залишаємо ці акти в сфері кримінальної відповідальності і визначаємо їх як звичайний злочин. Um, so the major point is that uh, worldwide experts have not defined the difference between those sections and we, we, we hope that today we will try to clear out a bit. Okay, good. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was quite useful. And let me turn to General Melinda. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. It's great to be a part of CyberSec. So, uh, thinking about what just was said about the Russian influence and uh, and uh, hackers' attempts or hack and attacks uh, targeted Ukraine. Uh, definitely, Ukraine has long been used as a, for my opinion, as a testing ground for uh, Russian offensive hacking capabilities. So it was already quite good brief about that made by the Minister Secretary of Defense about the, the, the examples of the, such attacks. However, I would like to remind you the attitude or uh, um, uh, the words that uh, President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, uh, stated once in 2017, he somehow compressed hackers to artist and he said that the the the, the hackers are as artists so they are free people and they uh, like a artist they uh, if they are in a good mood they get up in the morning and beginning painting their pictures so he said that the hackers do, do the same so they wake up in the morning they read about the some uh, developments and international affairs and they if they ha have Um, patriotic mindset, then they do what they can to uh, and attack the the, the uh, ones who say bad things about Russia. Or so so we can see how the how he somehow encourage uh, 
um, technical guys uh, to to do um, to, to mal do malicious activities uh, against uh, enemies of Russia. We have like today, I believe, the, the brand new information that uh, there was an attack uh, targeting to Canadian uh, Minister of Na National Defense. So we can say that it is because of the fact that that uh, Canadians say that we will support Ukraine um, in this uh, very difficult uh, situation. So we see uh, and have a lot of examples of uh, of uh, this uh, uh, this um, this activity uh, being conducted from from Russian territory. And uh, to answer somehow your questions about that, should uh, like what should be the the NATO, NATO attitude to that. It was quite good uh, stated by the Deputy Secretary General NATO during the keynote speech to the, today. And I believe it should be a uh, NATO should su support to Ukraine with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, fighting or with uh, with this uh, malicious activity, not only uh, in the cyber sphere but beyond. And but I believe we should take. Uh, we uh, should take any precautions to stop the um, malicious activity targeting Ukraine uh, without uh, not dividing it into domains. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a cyber or it is a attempt of invasion. So I believe we as a NATO, we are, as a, and every country of uh, NATO should do our best to not let to uh, conduct uh, uh, cyber malicious cyber operations uh, targeting Ukraine, but also to let to the invasion uh, and to to the to the Ukraine as well. So this is like my brief brief overview of uh, what was said already. Thank you. Okay. Um. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh. Well considered. Uh, can we turn to now to Fabrice Potier? Thank you very much. It's uh, you hear me well. It's a pleasure to be here today, especially to discuss uh, such a, a topical issue. Uh, whilst we're in the middle of a, a major crisis that, as we all know, has been completely engineered by um, Moscow. And, and I think I would like to build on what the uh, two previous speakers have, have just said in making here three points. One, the uh, cyber warfare and, and cyber attacks on uh, critical infrastructure is now becoming a, a quasi-permanent feature. Uh, the la last example being uh, the one mentioned by the two previous speakers, uh, the attack against 70 uh, Ukrainian government websites uh, which look like ransomware, but were ransomware with the intent of being destructive and not of uh, with the intent of getting a ransom. Um, but those uh, Ukraine is not the only playground for this type of cyber attack. We have seen, for example, across the European Union, if, if you take some examples over the past year, uh, uh, four uh, major uh, attacks on, on what we can deem critical infrastructure, like the European Medicine uh, Agency or the Irish uh, Health Agency. Um, so I think this is, we have to accept that this is now, uh, uh, cyber warfare is almost a permanent uh, conflict we are in. Um, and and th therefore it begs the question of how should we respond to it? And what we are seeing is currently a certain reluctance by mostly Western uh, NATO uh, agencies and governments to raise uh, the cyber war warfare at the same level as conventional or strategic uh, warfare and, and to be willing to signal that uh, a cyber attack will uh, uh, obviously provoke a, re a proportionate response. And my point today here is, I think we have passed now the time of keeping cyber warfare into a sort of gray zone. Uh, and we have to lift it up to part of our deterrence uh, toolbox. Uh, and I understand, and, and this is my second point, uh, uh, the limits uh, and the nuances in comparing cyber deterrence to more traditional deterrence. 
uh, uh, first, there is a certain impunity and a lawlessness in the cyber field that you don't have in, you know, when it comes to nuclear weapons or conventional uh, weapon system. Uh, obviously, every cyber weapon is also tailor-made uh, for certain attack, contrary to other weapon system. Uh, we can also, the cost of a cyber attack, you can relatively, at least comparatively, recover from it compared to, let's say, a dramatic uh, nuclear attack where the cost and the recovery uh, can be uh, completely uh, unacceptable and unfeasible. And finally, there is the well-known problem, uh, which is not uh, uh, unsolvable, but still a challenge of attribution and clear attribution uh, uh, which means that it's, it, take, it can take some time before you can uh, uh, solidly attribute a cyber attack to specific actor, agent, or sovereign uh, state, uh, and therefore uh, uh, justify uh, a targeted response. However, I think it's still time to now put cyber part of our broader uh, uh, toolbox because uh, what we are seeing is we should not focus on what kind of um, what cyber involves, which is mostly bits and data, uh, but we should focus on the intent behind the use of cyber weapons. And if the intent, as we have seen, for example, last week uh, with the uh, Russian uh, uh, sponsored attack against Ukraine, uh, if the uh, cyber attack is has the intent of causing destruction to other virtual or physical infrastructure to cause damage, I think it can be deemed as an attack and therefore should be, uh, uh, should be responded to. And my final point here is, what should we do? Uh, I think first, uh, the work in defining what critical infrastructure is, is essential to actually having a solid cyber deterrence strategy. So I think the work that the European Union is doing the work that NATO internally has been doing, the uh, work also that has been started under President Obama in the United States to define those critical infrastructure is, is very important because it basically delineates uh, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of targeting. And then the, the second is to also, I think, work on obviously our systems and our capabilities uh, uh, Different, there are different capabilities available across NATO, depending on, on, on the, the NATO member state. But obviously, we have to be able, if we want to have a meaningful deterrence, especially at the collective level, so at the NATO or potentially the EU level, you need, these organizations need to have the platform and the uh, capacity to plug national capabilities and form a collective cyber response. And finally, and that's my very uh, last point, as with any deterrence, messaging and signaling is, is crucial, is actually the essence of deterrence. And here, therefore, once and if we have uh, defined more clearly what critical infrastructure are, if we have developed robust cyber operational planning and capabilities at the collective level, meaning NATO and EU level, the third bit would be to have a clear cyber posture that can be actually sent as signaling to our cyber adversaries. So this is my call today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I like a lot of these comments and then we will uh, go to Alessia Kacheva and for your comments. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to such distinguished panel and uh, I want to begin by uh, making an important disclaimer that as an American I believe that NATO must deter any act of war against Ukraine either it takes place in cyberspace or in the physical domain uh, this is our duty as to partners uh, however as a political scientist I'm gonna put uh, on my uh, academic hat and is I believe it's my duty also to raise some cautions uh, starting to drawing parallels between the cross-domain theory uh, as it was developed uh, in the nuclear domain to deter convention uh, 
a chance for cross-domain deterrence. And what I will say is uh, quite the opposite of what we just have heard from the Mr. Pothier, which makes our discussion and our panel uh, somewhat like more uh, lively, hopefully. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, the big question whether uh, deterrence in uh, cyber domain uh, could be applied effectively uh, consists in the um, bitter and the ongoing uh, vibrant uh, theoretical debates in the literature that questions whether a signaling uh, and um, uh, posturing and communication of threshold is uh, as clear as in the uh, nuclear and conventional dom domains. And uh, uh, part of the reason for this is uh, the nature of the cyber domains that makes uh, credible posturing of your forces uh, or your capabilities to that matter is highly difficult because the moment those capabilities are discovered, uh, it becomes very easier to, to patch those capabilities and exploitation of new ones uh, takes time. So uh, even when it comes to credible signaling that you have capabilities uh, to deter, uh, to, to, uh, to deploy uh, cyber weapons becomes much more complicated in the cyberspace. Uh, the second issue uh, when it comes to using cyber uh, as a using cyber operation as a deterrent uh, comes to um, the lack of common understanding uh, even within the alliance as well as against adversaries about whether the uh, special thresholds are actually may uh, crossed uh, uh, because uh, the way how escala escalation unfolds in conventional domains, uh, we look at the intensity of conflict, we looked at the number of um, casualties, we look at the geographic scope of the conflict to infer whether the adversaries are escalating or de-escalating. In a cyber domain, once you start allowing for additional like uh, cyber uh, uh, weapons being deployed, uh, then the question what is escalation or what is de-escalation becomes uh, rather problematic and uh, as uh, we saw for example today there was an attack on Canadian infrastructure and uh, what are we trying to infer from that? Is it that uh, Russians are avoiding of direct confrontation? That's why they're de-escalating uh, by uh, evolving or deploying the uh, cyber like uh, uh, weapons or whether, uh, but it increases the geographic scope of the conflict. It involves the immediately like NATO members uh, rather than NATO partners or whether they are escalating. So the dynamic between escalation and the escalation is uh, much more complicated and much less clear, uh, which creates a greater potential for miscommunication and miscalculation of what this adversary is trying to do. So intent is itself is not always clear. And another underlying assumption is that uh, the conflicting parties in the uh, cross-domain uh, like deterrence uh, theory have perfect control over the tools and as we have saw in the previous like, uh, presentations that the degree of coordination between the hackers and the developments of the ground varied over time depending on which phase uh, we are entering and we're looking at in Ukraine conflict. Uh, we also like uh, reminded uh, politely that hackers are pretty much autonomous actors. Uh, so the degree of control over which uh, uh, conflicting parties have over this quasi-private uh, um, like actors is highly questionable to start immediately drawing parallels between uh, the nuclear conventional and as well as cyber conventional. So I would be uh, more cautious is uh, deploying or relying on this across the main uh, deterrence framework to make uh, specific recommendations at this stage. So that's I will stop here for the time being. Okay, uh, that was a, a robust set of discussion points. Uh, let me take a minute or two and get into the second question. And it goes as follows. In the 1960s, U.S. nuclear policy frowned on France's acquiring nuclear weapons, even though it added to the total warheads facing the Soviet Union. The reason was that an independent French nuclear policy, U.S. officials believed, would interfere with any U.S. attempt to manage a nuclear conflict in ways that would establish a firebreak between counterforce and counter-value nuclear use. Switching now to cyber, 
would the West be better off if its cyberspace responses in this, in as distinct from their sanctions responses, which actually do work much better collectively, wouldn't it, the West be better off if its cyberspace responses were unified, or would it be better off if there were several more or less independent deterrence postures within NATO so as to complicate the calculations of malicious actors in cyberspace, malicious state actors in cyberspace? And this time, instead of going in alphabetical order, I'd like to just do the reverse and uh, go in reverse alphabetical order and bearing in mind that we have a little less time left, so if we can keep our remarks succinct. So, let's go back to uh, Olosia Kacheva. Well, uh, thank you. And um, it also points, brings us to the second question, whether NATO needs uh, a unified uh, posture in the cyber domain uh, and uh, whether it's feasible, right? Uh, um, so, in theory, it's not a bad idea to have a NATO unified posture on cyber. Uh, the usually NATO summit communications could be served as a way of signaling uh, where the allies stand in relationship to the specific cyber threats and uh, the need to developing uh, which uh, particular cyber capabilities. Um, uh, but. Uh, Sometimes, as we know, with uh, lots of discussions uh, that happen at NATO, reaching the least common denominator uh, for political and cultural and institutional constraints uh, uh, becomes uh, difficult uh, and at times like, um, not feasible. So what would be useful uh, thing to do in the midterm rather than looking at the high level strategic documents and uh, level uh, high level uh, strategic agreement uh, is uh, to spend more time uh, looking at the tactical and operational way how uh, NATO is um, executing a cyber option by relying on the voluntary contribution from the uh, allies. And uh, this creates uh, the current setup, the current existing institutional uh, setup creates lots of asymmetries uh, between the commanders who decide whether to deploy uh, and utilize the enabling uh, cyber effects uh, and the um, partner, uh, the ally who is willing to contribute it because uh, the commander doesn't really quite have information due to the intelligence sharing agreements, lack of them, on what uh, particularly is going to be deployed. And uh, uh, that could be uh, one of the fruitful way of uh, looking at how NATO could be start converging into a uh, least common denominator and uh, um, in enhancing its uh, existing cyber capabilities uh, by uh, streamlining more operational and tactical ways in which uh, cyber currently is supposed to be used uh, while the strategic document potentially will come around like um, down the road. So that's to keep my remarks short. Okay, shall we continue? Yeah. Please. So uh, I would also take on that, that question, a uh, very interesting point. I, I think we don't have the luxury of choice. Uh, first, of course, uh, cyber capabilities are first and foremost national and will remain so. Uh, to and, and a large extent of those capabilities are obviously sensitive, mostly related to intelligence services and agencies. Uh, and, and, and there's nothing wrong about that. But I, I, I do think that it is important now to add a credible operational collective level uh, in our cyber posture. Um, simply because, as I said, uh, cyber warfare is now so central and in a way a permanent state of conflict that uh, a collective organization like NATO, but also the EU cannot afford not to have a credible operational capacity. And here, I take, uh, uh, just to provoke the previous speaker, I'm going to use, uh, again, the comparison with nuclear weapons, which I was using at the time when I was at NATO to push for uh, a more cyber operational mindset at NATO. Uh, nuclear weapons are extremely sensitive, are based on planning that uh, even, uh, you know, NATO allies don't, don't share to the, to, the, to the maximum extent. And yet, NATO has managed to have a credible nuclear posture. And, and I think it's the same for cyber. Even though it is very sensitive, it is closely held by each NATO ally, there can still be a collective sharing to a certain extent. And, and here, I think it's about 
building the operational capacity within the NATO common structure so that nations can plug and play and bring their own capabilities when we deem it right. To give you one last piece of example, I was uh, participating in the tabletop uh, in Washington on uh, the, the GIQ gap, uh, so the Northern Atlantic uh, uh, area, and, and it was a crisis with an adversary uh, called something similar, that sounded similar to Russia. It was mostly submarine, but one of the prime responses of some of the big allies in the tabletop, the US and France and the UK, were cyber uh, offensive. Uh, the problem is they did that on a national basis without sharing with the rest of the allies and with the NAC. And therefore, there was a kind of operational uh, uh, dissonance in what some nations were doing and what NATO was doing at a collective level. And basically, on the, during the tabletop, uh, the adversary used that gap to actually drive a wedge between what NATO was doing and planning and what some allies were doing. So this is just to reinforce the case that we cannot have the luxury of not having credible operational collective capacity to bring the national capabilities together and, if needed, have a collective cyber response. Okay, um, going over General Melinda. Okay, thank you. So let me start with saying that comparison with the nuclear weapons is quite good, thinking about the deterrence. So because of the fact that nuclear weapons are a perfect example of a weapon which uh, was built of the, uh, of the power of deterrence, because nuclear weapons were, have been used uh, in wartime uh, twice in my in kind of history, and the rest of the power of nuclear weapons were, uh, have been for decades and decades being in deterrence, in knowing who has nuclear weapons and do not start the conflict with those who have uh, uh, nuclear weapons because they do have nuclear weapons. And deterrence is challenging. So now how deterrence? We used to have a, or we still have a military rates when we show the power, we show the, 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 how um, good, well um, equipped the soldiers are, uh, how to, to build, a, to create a credible defense in the eyes of the enemies, just to show them that we, uh, they shouldn't attack us because of the power that we have. Um, thinking about the cyberspace and the deterrence, it is not as simple as it was already stated. Uh, because how you, how do you do a military parade in the cyberspace? How do you prove that you have like quite good, uh, for example, offensive capabilities? Uh, and everything is uh, in the fog of cyber because uh, there is a lack of visibility uh, in which into which countries and which military have they uh, and what kind of capabilities. And thinking about the NATO and the posture and the deterrence uh, is that deterrence aims to discourage an uh, adversaries from taking offensive actions. And traditionally, uh, especially in NATO, it, it uh, has two pillars. So we have like uh, deterrence by uh, denial and deterrence by punishment. So the first refers to measures that reduce or eliminate the benefits of creation, aggressive move or uh, attacks. Uh, and uh, why the second seeks to impose additional costs for performing uh, such kind of attacks. So I believe that NATO has traditional mandate to defend defended its own uh, systems and it fits great, great uh, into the, the, the model of deterrence by denial uh, or the part of this uh, framework. And as it was already stated, uh, of course, the deterrence by punishment, however, is more controversial uh, because of the problem of attribution and uh, to find the common agreement uh, and common understanding uh, between the countries what, what, what is the threshold of the attack and how we should, uh, um, uh, should uh, deal with, with, uh, with uh, that. Uh, it was already also stated that uh, we should uh, try to 
um, bypass obstacles on the way. And one of the such obstacles is sharing the information about uh, not only about the, the IOC, about the threat actors, but, uh, but also about our capabilities and what can we do with that as a, as a NATO, but also as a, a single, single uh, state of the NATO. So, so I believe that's that's the main uh, main um, goal now, or main uh, uh, that we should focus on is how we should agree with exchanging sensitive information about um, um, cyber capabilities uh, to uh, be with, with each other, and uh, how we could somehow use this uh, cyber as a deterrence at all, because nowadays it's not as obvious. Thank you. Okay, let us shift over and your comments, please. Я повністю погоджуюся з доповідачами. I fully support the viewpoints of the previous speakers. Як такого спільного стримування не може бути в принципі. Because as such, the common deterrence could not exist. Я лише вважаю про те, що спільні дії можуть бути лише після того, якщо ми проведемо злагодження наших кіберпідрозділів. I only consider that this, uh, the co common deterrence can uh, take place if we will um, start the, uh, teaming up and working up of our cyber units. Implementуємо термінологію єдину. And uh, implement the common uh, terminology. Тоді нам дасться більш-менш на якомусь рівні спільні проводити акції. And uh, to some extent, to, uh, at some level, we will be able to hold uh, uh, common uh, some actions. Демонструючи свою силу, міць і спроможність. Uh, by demonstrating our force, capabilities and uh, readiness. А так, в постійній побутовій роботі ми повинні працювати по мірі своїх можливостей і саме головне – постійно здійснити обміном інформацією та інцидентів. But uh, in everyday life we we still we, we have to continue our operations and what is uh, the most important we have to expand this uh, sharing of information between partners. І якби була така ініціатива і можливість створення єдиної натівської бази обміну чутливої інформації та можливостей відкритих and if there uh, the merge such a uh, opportunity to establish the unified nato platform for sharing uh, some uh, sensitive information на підставі якої б єдине командування б могло б визначати спектри спільних дій тоді б напевно воно мало б якийсь сенс based on which the uh, unified command would deter define what actions to take then maybe this will have some sense Тому що до цього часу не завжди ми можемо вчасно, реагуючи на інцидент, визначити, чи це злочинна діяльність, чи це атака державної організації тої чи іншої держави. Тому що навіть зараз ми не можемо визначити, чи це спеціальна атака чи інцидент була акція, як кримінальна акція, чи хостильна акція в якомусь стані. Остання атака, яка відбулася, вона була повністю замаскована під злочинну атаку. Діяльність. Uh, recent attack we had in Ukraine was uh, completely masked by uh, um, cr criminal activities. Але при цьому були застосовані атрибуції багатьох відомих вже груп на сьогодні. Uh, but uh, attributions of many uh, famous cyber uh, groups were utilized in this attack. Тому моє таке враження, що все-таки ми повинні спільно здійснювати якісь атаки лише в тих випадках, коли буде визначено, що ми повинні спільно показати і здійснювати так звану контратаку. My stance is that we have to do some counter uh, some uh, attacks uh, only if, if we define that we are authorized to to do this. А будувати свою систему стриманості в кіберпросторі ми повинні здійснювати кожен у відповідності до своїх можливостей. 
and uh, it built uh, our the deterrence capabilities. We, we have to do this on, on our own and develop our nation's capabilities for them to unite afterwards. If to put it briefly, thank you. Okay, um, we have seven minutes left, so I'm going to ask a short question. I'm going to ask for short answers. And here's a short question. Are Russian activities in cyberspace currently deterring NATO from doing things that they would otherwise do in both in the, in the case of the current crisis and overall? In other words, are we being deterred? So um, let's go in forward alphabetical order this time, and we bring you back to the former speaker if you'd like to address that. Do you understand the question? I mean, I made myself kind of clear. Я лише можу констатувати ті факти, які вже є. Фактично, Російська Федерація демонструє свої можливості. I can only state the existing facts, and I, I think that Russia only demonstrates uh, its capabilities it already has. Що повністю поєднується з його військовими діями, які він демонструє. And which fully is, is fully combined with the military actions it also applies. Одним словом, це залякування з його сторони, яке він намагається продемонструвати у всьому світу. It's just a threatening from uh, from his uh, from its side which is tries to demonstrate to the world. Тому що ті атаки, які він вчиняє, є корисними для його держави, вони фактично залишаються непомітними, або його угрупування стараються це не показувати. Because the uh, cyber attacks which are useful for Russia, they remain hidden and they try not to, to demonstrate anyhow the traces of those attacks. Тому зазвичай публічні його дії вже стоять після того, як фактично він навмисно демонструє про вразливість тої чи іншої системи. And usually some public actions are made when um, uh, this uh, some uh, purposeful demonstration of vulnerabilities of that or this system uh, is revealed by them. Із всіх атак, де є причетна Російська Федерація, є лише одиничні випадки, де фактично він був, його операції в кіберпросторі були виявлені на підготовчому етапі. There are only uh, single examples of when the uh, intents of uh, Russian uh, were revealed that the preparatory steps. А зазвичай всі відомі факти це є публічно показові атаки, які він намагається показати, що він може зробити ще гірше. And uh, all the uh, vast majority of the attacks are just public demonstrations of what Russia can do further to, to threaten the community. Тому на наш погляд, це його так більш-менш показове етап стримування, но ніяк не його основні атакуючі сили. So we consider it just a demonstrative part of Russia's deterrence and not the, the true capabilities in deterrence. Thank you. Okay, that, that, that was uh, thought-provoking. Um, General Melinda? Okay, so uh, thinking about these massive cyber attacks against Ukrainian infrastructure, as well as information operations targeting Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian citizens, etc. I don't feel that we are we are not uh, aware of that, or we uh, we quite good know the capabilities of Russians and their attitude to to and their capability to conduct uh, offensive operations against uh, different countries. So we are aware of that. We are preparing for uh, for for such. Uh, uh, attempts of attacks or at attacks. We see that such kind of uh, attempts in our infrastructure as well. So we, I don't feel treated as a as a uh, as a building a new knowledge about that. Uh, for sure, it is being uh, quite good known among experts, cybersecurity experts, about their capabilities. Um, maybe at some um, um, decision makers' levels, they those examples could, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, start to, to, to be noticed as well. However, in Poland, I'm aware and I believe uh, even decision makers are aware 
about uh, such kind of capabilities that uh, Russia has. Um, um, so, so I don't think that it, it changed a lot. However, it is another example that, that uh, they operate uh, aggressively, uh, offensively against uh, different, uh, another country. And I believe it is a quite good point to, for a discussion that how we could support with uh, each other. Thank you. Okay, um, next. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a very good question. Uh, not not uh, ask uh, often enough, and I will. My answer would be that I think as long as we stick to the current uh, doxa and definition of cyber warfare, where we are extremely reluctant to uh, put cyber into a broader deterrence thinking, which is what I've heard from some of the speakers today. As long as we do that, I think what we're seeing is we're leaving the escalation advantage to our adversaries. Uh, mostly autocracies, uh, who are actually much uh, better at operating into the gray zone. And therefore, I think if we don't want to be deterred or if we don't want to be scared or economically coerced, uh, I think we have to signal much more to those adversaries what the cost of the cyber offensive activities would be, either in the cyber domain, but also in other more conventional military domain. So uh, I, I don't think we are being deterred as such, but I think we are leaving the advantage of escalation to the others. Okay, and last one, take it away. Okay, very quickly. Uh, first of all, NATO is a defense alliance, right? Uh, and uh, what the attacks do or the use of cyber weapons does, it makes us stronger, it makes us more united, it encourages us to build capabilities in a way uh, that is beneficial to the whole alliance and it makes the political will to use those uh, capabilities stronger. So I wouldn't perceive it as deterring. What deters us is our commitment to defense uh, and our internal institutions that regulate the use of the offensive um, cyber capabilities. So I'll put it this way. Okay, and with that, it is 7.10, 7.10 is here, uh, 1.10 over there, and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak. Thank you for all the panelists uh, with their wise and useful remarks, and I will turn this over to the uh, program chair.